chapter 4, verse 20, well, 13 through 22. So Boaz took Ruth, and she became his wife. And when he, w when he went in to her, the Lord gave her conception, and she bore a son. Then the woman said to Naomi, Blessed be the Lord who gave has not left you this day without a close relative, and may his name be famous in Israel. And may he be to you a restorer of life and a nourisher of your old age. For your daughter-in-law who loves you, who is better to you than seven sons, was born him. Then Naomi took, his, took the child and laid him on her bosom and became a nurse to him. Also the neighbor woman gave him a say, name, saying, There is a son born to Naomi. And they called his name Obed. He is the father of Jesse, the father of David. Now this is the genealogy, genealogy of Perez. Perez begot Hezron, Hezron begot Ram, and Ram begot Ammonadab, Ammonadab begot Nashon, and Nashon begot Sa Salmon, Salmon begot Boaz, and Boaz begot Obed, Obed begot Jesse, and Jesse begot David. Good job, Mason, with those names. All right, let's, uh, let's begin with a word of prayer. Our Father in heaven, this evening we come to you and we are grateful uh, to be afforded this occasion uh, where we can open up your word. And Father, as we have in recent weeks been looking at the Old Testament book of Ruth, we want to thank you for preserving that scripture for us. Father, thank you for the many wonderful lessons that we can learn from it. Thank you for the history of it all. Thank you for the encouragement that the book gives us as we read it. And, and we are reminded of the fact that you, you love your people and that you were at work in our lives and in the world. All to our good. And we thank you and we praise you for that. Father, as we enter into this period of Bible study, we pray that we can reflect upon your truth and, and be changed by it. So that we can be people of truth. Uh, who exude your love and your mercy and your grace to a world that desperately needs it. Thank you for your son, Jesus, the son of David, and in his name we pray. Amen. Uh, well, as I alluded to in the prayer, I do want to catch everybody up to speed. In recent weeks, we've been studying through the book of Ruth on Sunday evenings, and tonight we'll be wrapping up that particular study. But before we get to Ruth, I want to begin with a passage in Acts chapter 2. Acts chapter 2, uh, I want to consider with you an excerpt from Peter's sermon that is found at uh, verse 22, verse 22. And the reason why I want to begin here tonight is to remind us of the fact that, that God, God has a will, God has a plan. And when it comes to the will of God, when it comes to the plan of God, everything's, everything goes in accordance to the plan. Uh, even if it's painful along the way. So are you with me in Acts chapter 2? Uh, we'll look at verse 22 beginning. Peter says, Men of Israel, hear these words. Jesus of Nazareth, a man attested to you by God with mighty works and wonders and signs that God did through him in your midst. As you yourselves know, this Jesus delivered up according to the definite plan and foreknowledge of God, you crucified and killed by the hands of lawless men. God raised him up, loosing the pangs of death because it was not possible for him to be held by it. I share this verse with you to bring to your remembrance uh, the idea that, that God, again, has a plan. God has always had a plan. And according to Peter on Pentecost, the plan of God is Jesus. And he's always been the plan. The, all that happened in the life of Jesus, all that occurred, even the death of Jesus, the rejection of Jesus, that was all according to the uh, foreknowledge of God and the, the definite plan of God. So when we talk about salvation and the, the scheme of redemption, 
You know, God didn't throw all this together uh, by, by chance and happenstance. God had a plan. Even before he made the foundations of the earth, God knew what would happen, and in the process of time, God would bring about the fulfillment of his divine plan. Now, that, that's true for the life of Jesus, but I, I want you to consider that that was true leading up to the eventual birth of the Savior. It, it's true that God had a plan in the Garden of Eden. It's true that God had a plan when he first called Moses. It is true that God had a plan uh, when Joshua was leading, through, uh, th leading Israel through the land of promise. It, it's true that God had a plan in the days of the judges. And in the book of Ruth, that is where we find the setting for our story. Uh, in the days of the judges. These were very dark days, very wicked days. They were days in which there was no king in Israel. These were days in which every man did that which was right in his own eyes. Really, these were the days of, of anarchy in a lot of respects. And the book of Ruth begins with uh, a somewhat humble story uh, with uh, a focus on one particular man and his family. Uh, the man's name is Elimelech, his wife's name is Naomi, and they two together have uh, two children, Malon and Kilian, their two sons. And so the book of Ruth begins with this family in a time of hardship making the, the tough decision to leave the land of Canaan and go to sojourn in the land of Moab. Uh, and you might say, well, well they, they shouldn't have done that. That's what they did. That's what they did. And our actions, our choices have consequences. And so there in the land of Moab, uh, these three men die in their 10-year sojourning, leaving Naomi behind. Naomi is a widow. Uh, on top of that, she's a grieving mother who has lost her sons. But all is not lost for Naomi. She has someone very close to her someone who's special to her there with her. And that is, of course, uh, the namesake of the book of Ruth, Ruth herself. Uh, it is only Ruth that decides to make a commitment to stay with Naomi. Um, the other daughter, uh, Orpah, decides that after some convincing that she indeed will go and return to the land of Moab. But the, the story of Ruth is how these two women, Naomi and Ruth, they together... Uh, embark upon this difficult return uh, for Naomi back to the land of Canaan, back to uh, the general population of the people of God. And, and just by way of review, remember that whenever Naomi comes back to Israel, that people, they kind of recognize her, but they can tell that she's, she's had a, a pretty tough time. Uh, she, she uh, Naomi, that is, wants the people of God to call her by a different name. Do you remember what that name was? Mara, that's right. And what does Mara mean? Bitter, call me bitter. Why? She would say that the Lord has dealt bitterly with me. And so at the end of chapter 1, we, we, are, um, we see a bitter woman, a bitter woman uh, who all that she has is, is Ruth. But but Ruth is really a remarkable person. She is a person of great integrity. She is a person of, of great faith. She is someone uh, whose, whose faith and, and optimism, and that's a word maybe we haven't talked about enough in this study, optimism would lead to better circumstances by the grace of God. So in chapter 2, we met a man by the name of Boaz. And he, too, is a, a person of great integrity, a person of great character. Boaz, ladies, he's the kind of man that you'd be happy to bring home to mama. Boaz blesses Naomi, blesses Ruth. Uh, he provides uh, for them. And at the end of chapter 2, Naomi is really beginning to sing a different tune. Uh, she's beginning to have some hope restored back to her life. To the point where at the beginning of chapter 3 in Ruth, she's ready to be matchmaker. And so she orchestrates this, this occasion where, where Ruth will go to Boaz at a certain place at a certain time and ask for Boaz to redeem uh, her. 
And last week we talked about what that entailed. We talked about redemption and, and the fact that there were certain Jewish laws uh, that we find in the book of Leviticus chapter 25, for example, that uh, gave, uh, gave people the opportunity if they lost something to get it back but they needed someone to help them and that person is called a redeemer and just by way of review that redeemer had to be someone in their family and boaz certainly fits the bill so we'll talk more about this tonight but i'm just kind of bringing you back to speed now in ruth chapter 3 whenever ruth makes that request that boaz would spread his wings over her for he is a redeemer we saw in that text that Boaz was willing to do that. He was willing to pay the price so that Naomi and Ruth could be redeemed. But in chapter 3, we are left with some suspense. There's a little bit of tension there because Boaz, being a person of integrity that he is, uh, he's going to say the truth about the situation. He would love to redeem Ruth, However, in verse 11, in verse 11 of chapter 3, we read, And now, my daughter, do not fear. I will do for you all that you ask. For my fellow townsmen know that you are a worthy woman. And now, or here it is, now it is true that I am a redeemer. Yet there is a redeemer nearer than I. So one thing we talked about last week was that in the uh, Levitical laws of redemption, it is the one who was nearest of kin who was qualified to be the redeemer. In other words, if you, you know, being the nearest of kin to someone, you had the responsibility before anyone else to pay the price of redemption. Boaz is agreeing to do this, however, the law requires someone else to have the first opportunity. Now, here's the thing. We don't know who this person is. All we know is that he is closer in relation to Naomi and her family than, than Boaz is. He doesn't have a name in the book of Ruth, but he, by law, should be given the first opportunity. Now, I, I don't know. As I read through this, I, I hope he says no. I hope he says no, because we see Ruth and Boaz, they're good for one another. Um, so that's where we begin tonight. What is going to happen? What is going to happen? Is this uh, Redeemer, who is nearer than even Boaz, is, he's go is he going to rise up and pay the price of redemption for Ruth? If so, what will that entail? So we get to the conclusion of the matter in verse 1 of chapter 4. Now, we read that scripture reading just a moment ago. We read verses 13 through 22. You just saw how it ended. Let's see how we got there. In verse 1, Now Boaz had gone up to the gate and sat down there. And behold, the Redeemer of whom Boaz had spoken came by. This, this other man that Boaz spoke uh, about in chapter 3, well, here he is. And Boaz said, turn aside, friend, sit down here. And he turned aside and sat down. Uh, the fact that he went to the, the gate, that would be a very good place to find someone like this because in, uh, in this ancient culture, the gate was really the center of all business that would have transpired in the, in the city. It was where things would, would take place. Transactions would occur. So if you were looking for someone, this would be a pretty good place to find a person like that. This would also be the place where the, the elders of the, the town would congregate. And sure enough, that is precisely what we find here in verse 2. And he took ten men of the elders of the city and said, sit down here. So they sat down. So what's this all about? We, we learn uh, what, what this is all about in verse 3. Then he said to the Redeemer, Naomi, who has come back from the country of Moab, is selling the parcel of land 
that belonged to our relative Elimelech. Now again, last week we talked about some of, this, uh, some of these matters. We talked about how someone who was in a state of poverty in Israel, uh, they could essentially lease the land uh, that, that was given to them all the way back in the land uh, in, in the days of the conquest of Joshua. We talked about how the land was not to swap hands and how it was to stay in a family. Uh, but now we're, we're told in Ruth chapter 4 that Naomi's prepared to sell the land. What, what's this all about? Well, let's keep reading. Verse 4. So, Boaz, Boaz says, I thought I would tell you of it and say, but in the presence of those sitting here and in the presence of the elders of my people, if you will redeem it, redeem it. But if you will not, tell me that I may know, for there is no one besides you to redeem it, and I come after you. Right? You're, you're at the top of the list. You have the responsibility, you have the opportunity to redeem Naomi and her family. What will you do? So what is he going to do? Look at verse 5. Then Boaz said, oh, I'm sorry, um, let, let's get to the conclusion of verse 4. And he said, I will redeem it. So there's the answer, right? Um, we, we need someone to redeem the land uh, for the sake of Elimelech's family. Will you do it? He says, I will. I will redeem it. Now, wait a second. I thought Boaz and Ruth are going to get married. Well, let's keep reading. Verse 5, then Boaz said, the day you buy the field from the hand of Naomi, you also acquire Ruth the Moabite, the widow of the dead, in order to perpetuate the name of the dead in his inheritance. So here the man learns about something that he did not expect. He thought that he was just, you know, considering a a business transaction, you know, the acquisition of land. If that's all that it was, then, then he was ready to do it. He was ready to do it because what that would mean for him is that if he were to, in fact, redeem this land, that land would stay in his family, in his possession. Uh, so that would be something that would be very enticing for him to do. However, the mention of Ruth, the, Moabab, the Moabite, kind of complicates things a little bit. Because in marrying Ruth the Moabite, if it was the case that Ruth the Moabite would have children, do you know who would receive the land? It would be the child. And so this man is not willing to be charitable in that sense. Um, if you look at verse 6, we see that is his response. Then the Redeemer said, I cannot redeem it for myself, lest I impair my own inheritance. That would be too costly of, of a price to pay. So he says, take my right of redemption yourself, for I cannot redeem it. You see, in our culture, if two people want to get married... Uh, what's important is that they, they love each other, right? Got to have that, that spark. Uh, but in the Jewish culture, it was not so simple. There were various laws that had to be taken into consideration. There were various financial uh, obligations that uh, were, were brought into view. This man, in redeeming the land, uh, also was legally bound to marry Ruth. He was not willing to pay that price. And some might say, well, maybe he wasn't attracted to her. I don't think that that is likely. Ruth is a beautiful person inside, and I trust on the out. Uh, some say, well, maybe he was already married. Um, maybe. Maybe that is the case. But I believe that it's likely that he was not willing to pay the cost uh, in the sense of marrying her because if she were to bear children that land, the price of that land that he would pay for, it would just go away. And it would go back, revert to the family of Elimelech. That's what makes Boaz 
so incredible. Because what Boaz is going to do, he's not going to do it out of selfish ambition. He's not going to do it to get something. He's going to do it out of the goodness of his heart and out of love for Ruth. So look at verse 7. Let's see how all of that came to be. Verse 7, now this was the custom in former times in Israel concerning redeeming and exchanging. So we're reading here about a traditional custom. So the custom was to confirm a transaction, the one drew off his sandal and gave it to the other. And this was the manner of attesting in Israel. So when the Redeemer said to Boaz, buy it for yourself, he drew off his sandal. That's a little strange, right? Um, and some may say, you know, what is this all about? You're, you're removing a sandal. Um, there is a passage in Deuteronomy 25 that is not exactly a one-to-one -one comparison of what we are reading about here, but maybe it gives us some insight as to why this particular custom came about. So uh, let's, let's see that together. Deuteronomy chapter 25. We'll go back to Ruth momentarily. Deuteronomy 25, and uh, picking up at verse 7, verse 7, I want you to see uh, what the law of Moses had to say about sandals, and uh, especially how it pertains to marrying others. Verse 7, and if the man does not wish to take his brother's wife, and what this is talking about here is a man who has passed legally in the law of Moses. The man who was obligated to marry this, this woman would be the brother's, um, would be the man's brother. So if the man refuses to do that, then his brother's wife shall go up to the gate to the elders, which is kind of similar to what we're seeing here in Ruth, Right? and say, my husband's brother refuses to perpetuate his brother's name in Israel. He will not perform the duty of a husband's brother to me. Notice this, then the elders of his city shall call him and speak to him. And if he persists saying, I do not wish to take her, Notice verse 9, then his brother's wife shall go up to him in the presence of the elders and pull his sandal off his foot and spit in his face. That's a sign of shame, yes? Um, that was the law. If this man was not willing to go through with marrying um, the uh, the widow of his deceased brother. This is what legally should have transpired. Uh, she was to take his sandal off and spit in his face. And then notice that action would stay with the man for the rest of his life. Uh, so if we keep reading at verse 9, at, at mid part of that verse, and she shall answer and say, so shall it be done to the man who does not build up his brother's house. And the name of the house shall be called in Israel the house of him who had his sandal pulled off. Maybe that passage gives us a little insight as to why it's the case the man volunteered to take his own sandal off. Maybe to avoid having being spat upon. Uh, maybe that is the case. But nonetheless, this uh, custom that we're reading about here in Ruth, I, I think it's likely that it originated from that particular passage in Deuteronomy chapter 25. But the symbol, all of this is very symbolic. This man is removing himself from the responsibility of redeeming Ruth. Now, God will be the one to make the judgment about him, but what that gives Boaz the opportunity to do is to step up and to fulfill legally the role of the Redeemer. And you know what? Thanks be to God that he did that. And do you know why? Well, not only for Ruth's sake, not only for Naomi's sake, but also 
for our sake, for Israel's sake. Because, uh, you know, the book of Ruth, it begins with a small focus on one little family. All of this would have happened in the days of the judges. What is this all about? Well, by the end of the book of, the Ru- book of Ruth, we see how all of this, it leads to the eventual birth of David. David, yes, that David, uh, the king of Israel. Yes, that David, the one in whom God made the, the promise of, of kingship that through David's sons uh, would remain uh, the, uh, the reign of dominion in Israel. That David, who eventually would bring forth the Savior of the world, Jesus, the son of David. So I want you to think about this as we to close tonight. At the beginning of this, um, this Bible study together, I, I said that it's true that God has a plan. It's a definite plan. And God knows exactly what his plan is. We see his plan at work here in the life of Ruth, Naomi, Boaz, and even in the nation of Israel. All of this would help eventually in time, through the fullness of time, to bring forth the Savior, Jesus Christ, into the world. Now, if you were just looking at this situation from afar, you would say there's really nothing spectacular about it. Uh, It's just one man and his family going through a hard time. But that's the way that God's providence often is, right? Oftentimes, when we're in the middle of it, we don't even know that it's happening. We can only look back in hindsight and see, wow, I can't believe what God did. The Bible teaches us in Romans chapter 8 and verse 28 that we know that for those who love God, all things work together for good for those who are called according to his purpose. All things, uh, the good times, the bad times, the easy times, the hard times, all things work together for our good. Now, if you were Naomi in chapter 1 and you were feeling bitter and sorry, sorry for yourself and you showed Naomi that verse, of course it wasn't written yet, but if you presented to Naomi that idea, I don't think she would have... Uh, been one to uh, believe that easily. She rather believed that God dealt bitterly with her. But in time, in time, Naomi would come to see that God truly is good and that God is truly good to her. And the picture of joy that we see in Naomi is one that we should leave here from this place uh, in our hearts. We should see Naomi with that child on her lap, Obed, the child, uh, who is David's grandfather. She nursed that child, and and it's like it's a brand new person. How does that happen? How, How do you get from bitterness to joy? Well, God does that. God does that in your life. When you look to him, when you trust in him, when you do not give up on the journey of faith, when you cast your eyes on him, God will restore your hope and bring joy to your life. God has a way of doing that. And I I pray that if you're going through a difficult season of your life right now, this story uh, that we find in the Old Testament will speak volumes of, of blessings into your life and that you will be blessed from our study in uh, the book of Ruth. The last name that we read in Ruth, Ruth 4 and verse 22, is David. David, that great king of Israel. But as great as David was, there was someone even greater than David who would come. And that, of course, is the son of David, Jesus Christ. So let's finish in Acts chapter 2. How about we do that? We began there. Uh, Peter, after talking about God's plan and, and God's purpose... He would begin to make a contrast between David and Jesus. In verse 25 of Acts 2, we read, For David says concerning him, that's concerning Jesus, I saw the Lord always before me, 
for he is at my right hand that I may not be shaken. Therefore, my heart was glad and my tongue rejoiced. My flesh also will dwell in hope, for you will not abandon my soul to Hades or let your Holy One see corruption. You've made it known to me the paths of life. You will make me full of gladness with your presence. Brothers, I may say to you with confidence about the patriarch David that he both died and was buried, and his tomb is with us to this day. Being therefore a prophet and knowing that God has sworn with an oath to him that uh, he would set one of his descendants on his throne, he foresaw and spoke about the resurrection of the Christ, that he was not abandoned to Hades, nor did his flesh see corruption. This Jesus, God, raised up, and we are all witnesses. Being therefore exalted at the right hand of God, and having received from the Father the promise of the Holy Spirit, he has poured out this that you yourselves are seeing and hearing. You see, what Peter is getting at here in a beautiful way is that as great as David was, Jesus is so much greater. David, we can go to his tomb. Uh, there it existed in, uh, in Judea at that time. We could visit it. He's saying, we can't do the same for Jesus. He arose from the dead, and he is now Lord in Christ. And you've heard this preached many times before. You know it's true that that message was so convicting to the people who gathered today, or that day on Pentecost, to hear that gospel preaching uh, proclaimed. They cried out, men and brothers, what shall we do? And those people were told exactly what they needed to do in verse 38. Repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of your sins, and you shall receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. Peter would say that that promise, that promise is for you and for your children and for all who are far off, everyone whom the Lord our God calls to himself. According to verse 41, 3,000 souls were eager to do just that on that very occasion. Now, is there anyone here this evening who desires to repent of your sins and be baptized for the forgiveness of your sins? We're about to sing a song of encouragement, and this is the time for all of us to look within our hearts and to examine our ways. And if it's the case that any of us are not right with God, may we leave this place tonight in a right relationship with Him. God is at work in the world this has always been the case. Look for his plan and purpose in your life. If you are looking by faith, you will find it. But I know this. I know this for a fact. It is God's plan and purpose for your life to be saved. I know that. That is what the Bible teaches me. God does not want any of us to perish. He wants us all to come to repentance. And so tonight, if you feel repentance in your heart, would you come to Jesus Christ as we sing and stand?